Right, good morning everyone. And so now we move on to sexual dysfunction in young men. And our first speaker is Roland Rees, who's a sort of similar vintage to me. We did fellowships at the Institute of Urology and Andrology around the same time. He started off in Winchester, and now he works in Southampton, where he provides a sort of regional andrology and genitourethral reconstructive service. He's also part of the uh, Urology CRG for NHS England, and he's actually the uh, present secretary of this section. You okay, thank you, Paul. I was very chuffed to receive this uh, title to speak on. <laughs> it's a little bit left to feel, a bit off-piste for us urologists to um, delve into the field of psychogenic um, and psychosexual medicine, but nevertheless relevant. So if all of us who run ET clinics uh, do see these patients, and um, it's important we know, and this talk hopefully will just touch on um, what we do with these patients and what goes on in the, in the psychosexual world. So how common is ED in young people? Well, um, it is a, this is an important element of our, of our practice. Approximately, if you look at the um, studies there of men under the age of 40, approximately 10% of men under the age of 40, if you average those series up, um, have some form of ED. Rise, increasing from about 5% in the 20s to 10% in the 30s. And then uh, from the Massachusetts male aging study, we get up to approximately 40% of 40-year-olds uh, with some erectile problem or another. Um, here's a study from Italy looking, uh, founding that uh, one in four patients turning up to an ED clinic were under the age of 40. And interestingly, they on average had a, a more severe form of ED, presumably reflecting the fact that um, there are some congenital uh, primary erectile dysfunction patients in there. Um, they found that there was a higher proportion of youngsters who were smokers and also a significantly higher percentage, and 21% in this series, using uh, illicit drugs, cannabis, um, etc. Um, what about the definitions? Well, the traditional definition or the traditional thought was that most ED was uh, physically based. Um, it's obviously become more apparent that nearly every patient with erectile dysfunction has some sort of psychological element. So the, 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 the better terminology really is to refer to uh, it, a problem as either being primary organic or primary uh, psychogenic. And we're going to just talk about the primary psychogenic uh, cases today. Causes? Well, uh, if you take a look at all the uh, young men coming to the ED clinic, then psychogenic causes are high up the list. Drugs, as I've mentioned, smoking, cannabis, etc. Diabetes, obviously, uh, can affect the young as well as uh, the old. Fibrotic problems, trauma, post-priapism, Peyronie's disease can, can, can have a, a, a young age of onset. Um, pain, foreskin problems causing uh, issues with erectile dysfunction. Cycling, I know there's quite a few cyclists uh, come, down from the south co come up from the south coast, so um, I'll be seeing a few of those in the clinic next week, no doubt. Uh, <laughs> Venous and congenital problems um, presenting maybe as, as primary uh, ED as well as hypogonadism. Um, we talk about predisposing, precipitating, and maintaining factors I in psychogenic ED. So predisposing factors, things in the background that make, make this problem more likely, um, such as previous uh, past poor experiences, uh, relationship problems, cultural issues, um, gender identity issues, sexual abuse, etc. Um, and that's obviously a difficult um, topic to cover within the context of a, of a urology consult, but um, hence most ED clinics do have a longer appointment time, so we, we spend about half an hour with a nurse specialist um, to try and uh, get to the bottom of things. Then precipitating factors, factors that may spark off um, erectile dysfunction, new relationships, some acute problem either within the family or socially, um, partner being pregnant perhaps, menopause, there's all sorts of um, life events that can then trigger um, psychogenic erectile dysfunction. And maintaining factors, so in the, in the course of things, these are problems that make ED quite difficult to treat. Um, and this is where the counselling comes in really to try and explain to the patients, a lot of them who don't understand uh, what is going on, um, and the more the patients understand about these factors, relationship issues, communication, etc., uh, the, the better the outcome, but also the easier the problem becomes to treat. From a pathophysiology point of view, um, then is the theory is that uh, increased sympathetic tone due to stress, anxiety, depression, 
um, upregulates the adrenergic side of things, increases smooth muscle tone, and decreases the ability of the smooth muscle to relax, causing erectile dysfunction. Uh, and then, of course, the familiar vicious circle of failure, performance anxiety, uh, and, and worsened erectile dysfunction. How do they present? Well, uh, we're probably all familiar expressions uh, here on, on the screen. Um, but common patient characteristics, so clearly you may be taken history and there will be no obviously identifiable physical cause. Uh, there may be a psychiatric history, they may have urinary symptoms, they may have chronic pain, they may have sleep uh, issues, um, they may have a stressful job or lifestyle, and there may be some relationship concerns. These are just common patterns really. Performance anxiety, excessive preoccupation with the physical aspects of ED, uh, unrealistic expectations of a cure, a ten tendency to catastrophize, um, technologically savvy, that's another a trait of these types of people, uh, and also non-compliance, so um, not necessarily adhering to, to, to treatment. There's also a link with um, ejaculatory and orgasmic and desire disorders uh, in this study here, just showing that the worse the erectile function, the, the shorter the um, latency time of ejaculation. So going on to diagnosis, what do we do with these people? Well, you've got to treat them like any other uh, ED patient to start with and follow the BSSM guidelines and take a history and examine, genital examination, general examination, blood pressure, etc. But then you've got to focus in uh, and take a little bit more of a detailed psychosexual history. Uh, you need to clarify the problem. Is this ED? Is it a desire disorder? Or is it premature ejaculation? And um, it isn't always obvious. Then a history of the onset and the cause of the problem, um, how, what, what's going on currently in the relationship, what's happened in the past in terms of previous treatments, and how is the partner reacting and engaging. Um, engagement of the partner is useful, so you know when, when the guy turns up on his own that you, you can have a slightly more difficult task than if, if the partner's in the room. So do encourage um, them, the couple to come along if, if there is a partner, that is. Um, and of course, uh, history of masturbation um, uh, and the sort of situational element. You know, is this a problem only with the partner or with a certain partner, not with another, or uh, with uh, on masturbation alone? So um, it, it, that's a, a good sign. Um, lifestyle factors, obviously the non-sexual aspects of the relationship, uh, the vocational uh, and lifestyle issues. If somebody's sort of getting four hours sleep and a high, highly stressful job, then that might be a trigger. Um, re reproductive history, infertility, patients going through IVF. Um, people, maybe a guy doesn't want, doesn't actually want to fall to, to, to have, have have a family. Um, those sort of things. So delve into the the aspects uh, relating to the to the fertility side of things, um, and of course a mental health history. So ask about uh, previous performance anxiety, depression, any uh, any medications they may be taking, generalized anxiety disorder, etc. So you need to get a, a feel for uh, what is going on. Uh, and for me, I think the key factors here are, you know, is the erectile dysfunction situational? Is it just happening sometimes and not others? What's in the psychological history? Um, what is their relationship history like? What are they like in general, their behavior and their sort of mental state? Uh, and the denial aspect, and that's quite a big uh, factor in these, in these men. Denial is a big problem. They'll come in, they'll insist that uh, it isn't a psychological problem, um, and it's said that you know the more the more emphatic they are in insisting that it's not a psychological problem, then probably the more likely it is to be a psychological problem, uh, because essentially, um, a yeah, sort of level-headed patient will will accept what you're telling them and want to just engage and get on with it. But um, if they're insisting, they're refusing to see a counsellor uh, and wanting all the tests, then um, that's often often a, a sign. Uh, they'll often describe feelings uh, not based on the anatomy or the physiology of it. So they, they can feel the blood coursing through their veins and, uh, and all sorts of things. And, and these are just all, all comments that these men come out with. Um, you can use questionnaires, but um, I generally just use the IIEF questionnaire. There's a whole lot of other personality and depression scales that, quite frankly, I don't think we, we would use in, in the ED clinic. 
in terms of investigations, you just want to follow the standard um, standard uh, guidelines, plasma glucose, lipids, testosterone level, and then other hormones uh, as required. Uh, it is important to check the testosterone because if you list just some of the symptoms of depression and line them up against the signs and symptoms of a low testosterone, they, they can look identical. So um, it is important to, 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 to determine whether a patient is hypogonadal or not. Further investigations, well, this is where these guys will um, try and push for tests, and they will want all the tests um, in, in, and most of them believe that they have some sort of vascular, arterial, usually, or venous problem, and a lot of them will have read up about venous leaks and venous leak surgery, uh, and it sounds like a great quick fix, and that's often what they will be after. Um, sometimes the investigation is, of course, justified. Um, certainly if, if there's been a history of primary ED ever since um, adolescence, then they do need a, a vascular workup. Uh, and actually sometimes it's therapeutic um, just to undergo the tests, and that is part of their uh, learning process, if you like. Highly specialized tests, not used very often, but certainly a test that can determine uh, once and for all whether a problem is psychogenic or not is nocturnal penile tumescence testing. Originally the, uh, the STAMP test, um, this is a slightly more expensive version, where you have two strain gauges around the tip and the base of the penis um, measuring the rigidity, and we should expect between three and four erections a night. Uh, it's particularly useful for medical, legal, and forensic um, work. Here's a normal MPT trace with, um, as you can see, three or four uh, decent erections during the night, and then contrast that with uh, an abnormal trace, and that, of course, is, is, is organic or physical erectile dysfunction. Um, now, in terms of usage of this test is not a widely available test. It's not often necessary. It doesn't often change actually what you do or the, man or the management, but it can be quite effective in terms of um, showing a patient the trace. Uh, if, you, if somebody's insistent that they don't get any erections at all and you show them that trace, then um, that's often again a uh, forward step in terms of accepting uh, that actually it may well be a, a psychological issue. In terms of management, then I tend to try and get them to do some exercise if they're not doing exercise already. This is just my personal uh, sort of practice. Um, exercise has been shown to have a positive effect on mood and self-esteem, circulation, weight, and erectile uh, dysfunction. There, there it is in a sort of organic sense, uh, the link between physical activity and erectile dysfunction. So that's a good thing to get them to start doing. Um, in terms of the traditional approach, then it's been treating the organic. So most of us seeing these patients will offer them um, Viagra or the equivalent uh, and hope that everything will then fall, fall into place once they start getting better erections, their confidence improves, etc. Now that technique might work um, in the sort of milder end of the spectrum. Um, and bearing in mind that in some of the studies for psychogenic ED, up to 40% of men get a good response with the placebo uh, uh, arms. So uh, what else? Well, the definitive, the best way to deal with these patients, I think, is through a combination approach. So tackle it on all fronts simultaneously. Um, discuss counseling with them uh, and refer them on, but also um, try, and me try and treat uh, with, with sort of by. Uh, with the medication as well. Of course, it may require escalation, so in severe cases, you may need to escalate to intracavernosal injections um, or other MUSE, even penile implants in a, in a, in a tiny minority uh, of severe cases, but essentially, um, they need um, treatment on all fronts. And what happens? Well, um, psychosexual therapy, the mainstay is behavioral therapy, and this is something that you can do. Um, so the so-called uh, sensate focus, which is split up into three um, areas, non-genital, developing intimacy, but not concentrating on erections or penetration or anything. Then moving on to genital sensate focus, which um, involves stimulation, but no penetration. And then finally onto the penetrative sensate focus. This is a staged approach. Um, it's available to be printed out on, on the web, uh, and you can, I think, within a a 20 minute consultation, you can explain this to patients and get them started uh, rather than wait.
uh, months for the um, elusive uh, psychosexual counsellors. So um, Sense8 Focus is, is the mainstay, as I say, and that can be coupled with educational material um, to try and dispel any myths and um, sort of hang-ups that these, that these guys will have. Uh, less commonly used methods in the psychosexual world, cognitive therapy, which is a one-to-one -one thing, uh, and, and psychoanalysis, psychoanalysis, which has generally gone, gone out of favor, I, I am told. So what about the urologist in the clinic? Well, I think the most important thing for you guys is to um, use the, the, the consultation uh, as a starter, uh, as a sort of counseling session. What they need, you need to explain, and I often just get a piece of paper out and draw a diagram, explain the anatomy, explain the physiology, um, and try and get them to understand, because a lot of them just do not understand what is going on, understand the erectile process, and, and it suddenly, or not suddenly, but gradually, dawns on them as to possibly that, that this may well be uh, possibly a, a psychological problem and they need to start to accept that before that you can move on uh, with treatment. You need their engagement. If they're still refusing to accept that, then you're up against it. Um, this has been formalized in something called the PLICIT model, um, which is essentially the same as I've just said, which is to, to allow permission, start off, it's a staged approach to um, discussing the topic, permission to discuss it, starting off with limited, short bits of information, maybe start them on PD-5 inhibitors, then go on to the more specific things like sensate focus and ultimately on to intensive therapy, i.e. Uh, psychosexual counselling. Outcomes of psychosexual interventions, difficult to measure because high dropout rates, um, difficult to standardise, heterogeneous bunch of patients and a, and a very wide um, range of, of so-called cure rates. Um, but essentially, uh, there, was, there is one meta-analysis um, comparing uh, psychosocial intervention um, plus sildenafil uh, showing on average better outcomes than with medication alone in this group of patients. And it also reduces the dropout rate uh, of treatment. So in summary, um, you need to get patients to understand and accept the diagnosis before you can move forward. You can start the ball rolling within your ED clinic by broaching, but by, by, by sort of explaining things to them, by introducing them to the sensate focus, um, and then you may well need to um, combine that with a referral to the psychosexual counselors, um, which are variously available. So. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Roland. Very interesting. I'm sure that, like uh, many of us here, I'm guilty of not spending enough time looking at these psychosexual aspects. It's much easier to give Viagra. Just tell me quickly, because we'll, we'll ask questions at the end, what's access to psychosexual counselling like in your trust? Uh, nil in my trust. Uh, the community trust um, provides. So you've got to write back to the GP and say, please, can you refer on to, I think it's um, one of the community trusts, where there is a limited um, resource and a, and a long waiting list. So I often point them in the direction of Relate or the BASRT um, uh, websites, and you can put in your postcode and, and, and literally pay for it. But um, in terms of the NHS, then it is limited, but it is available. And, and it's very highly variable across the country, I think. OK. Thank you very much. We'll move on to our next speaker. OK. So next up, we have Mr. Ian Pearce talking about venous leakage, which I'm sure we'll all agree is a very difficult condition to diagnose and treat. Um, so Ian works at the MRI nearby and is currently the editor of the Journal of Clinical Urology. Thank you very much, and thanks for the plug. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so venous leak, a diagnostic and uh, therapeutic challenge. When Asif rang me and asked me if I'd take this on, I said, yeah, why not? I'll, I'll talk about that. It might be you know, interesting, useful. But what comes to, um, becomes very clear is that if someone like Asif rings you and tells you it's debatable, that that's the time that you should be thinking about running. Okay, so um, I thought I'd just do a quick literature review. And as you can see, there isn't a great deal of information out there. And in fact, if you, if you do a PubMed search for prostate cancer, you get over 100,000 hits. Okay. Even the humble frenuloplasty gains more than this. Okay. So th there isn't a huge amount, so fairly rapidly my thought process turned to um, one of horror. Um, 
This was essentially a consensus statement. In fact, I think the next speaker, Sooks, was also an author on this paper. And what this suggested was that the evidence base is weak. Not just is it weak, but actually in particular, we need to focus a bit more on venous outflow surgery. That was in 2010. Since then, we've had five papers. Only two of them are to do with any treatment. So we're really lagging behind. The pace of change isn't enormous. So the next time somebody asks you to talk about a debatable issue, just think twice. Okay. So what I'm going to do is talk a bit, bit about history, try and take you, well, I'm not going to try and take you through very much anatomy and physiology because I think that would waste our time here. Talk a bit about the definition, diagnosis, and then, of course, therapy towards the end. Erectile dysfunction, venous leak, goes back a long, long way. Aristotle thought that erections were air-filled. It was only when Leonardo da Vinci started observing hanged men that he realized that they were blood-filled. Ambrose Paré first decided that this was due to blood rushing into the male member. And then Pierre Dionis, who was surgeon to uh, King Louis XIV, also realized that it's not just blood going in, but it's actually trapping the blood in there, which gives you the erection. Now, the first surgery for venous leak was over 100 years ago, 1902. Just to put that into context, the ECG was a year away from being invented then. And look at the, look at the progress cardiology has made. The tea bag wasn't around. Powered flight was still a year away. So you can see how everything else has developed, but actually venous leak surgery is almost still in 1902. Or at least you will see by the end of this morning. So what about the anatomy? This is really the venous drainage. Everyone will have seen this. It's in pretty much every textbook, including the one that I've plagiarized it from today. And essentially what, I, what this shows really is that you need to be thinking about ligating pretty much everywhere. And we'll talk a bit more about that uh, in just a second. So what is a, a venous leak? It is really just a failure of veno-occlusive mechanism. Not just the spell check, but actually the whole process itself. To such an extent that penile tumescence fails to occur or perhaps also disappears before one can use the erection. Now, this is the take from Sicker's paper, which is a standard operating uh, policy or practice for the diagnosis of venous leak surgery. And uh, these parameters, which have been adopted by the EAU, show that you should have a peak systolic velocity of greater than 30, an end diastolic velocity of less than five, and a resistive index of greater than 85. That would be normal, but that's not to say that that would diagnose a venous leak if those parameters weren't the same. What has also become um, clear since September of last year when Pagano published his paper is that the location of your colored Doppler ultrasound dictates the diagnosis. And there's a significant difference in the diagnosis of venous leak based on these accepted parameters, depending on where you actually do the scan whether it's um, at the, at the crura, whether it's the um, midway from the cavernosal artery. So we clearly haven't got the full picture despite this very valiant attempt at an SOP. What are the finer points? Well, actually, a, a venous leak diagnosis based on colored digital Doppler ultrasound relies on a normal peak systolic velocity because, of course, if you don't have a normal peak systolic velocity, then you're also into the realms of having perhaps mixed um, erection issues, in other words, arterial insufficiency. Classically, if you have a peak systolic velocity of greater than 25, then your vascular or your arterial integrity is pretty much assured. Okay. If you have good arterial inflow as defined by a peak systolic velocity of over 25, along with an end diastolic vol velocity of greater than 6 and a resistive index of less than 6, that would diagnose a venous leak. The difficulty, of course, is that the parameters are such that there is therefore gray area between 5 and 6 and between a resistive index of six, uh, 0.6 and 0.85. So it's not quite as clear cut as we would like. We, uh, Roland talked very nicely about nocturnal penile tumescence in the Rigi scan. And classically speaking, you should have greater than 2 centimeters tumescence at the subcoronal band and greater than 3 at the base. What that shows, of course, when you have a nocturnal um, penile tumescence test on a rigid scan is that you have radial rigidity. And that doesn't necessarily equate to axial rigidity, although it does relate to the degree to which the penis, the, the erect penis, can withstand buckling and therefore must be proportional to the ability to penetrate. The venous leak, well, they would suggest that the best event really is less than 11.5 minutes. That gives you good, decent accuracy of over 80%. 
tip rigidity of less than 36. Uh, those people who, who use Rigiscan will know that the Rigiscan exerts a pressure. That pressure then causes the band to reduce in size, depending upon the quality of the erection. So the more phrase the book would use, probably a raging erection. The more raging your erection is, the less the band's going to reduce. Okay. So a rigidity of less than 36.5% essentially means that with particular pressure, the band has reduced quite significantly. In other words, the erection isn't of very good quality. But again, what we can't figure out really is how does arterial insufficiency influence the results of this? And false negatives, of course, things like depression, which we talked about, sleep apnea, don't forget, it's present about 5% of the population, so it's, it's worth thinking about. That looks really at a two-dimensional picture. Electrobioimpedance looks at a three-dimension. This is volumetric change in the penis with erection. This is quite, again, a specialist test, actually not really available very much outside of a niche market, and essentially works on the principle that the greater the erection, the lower your impedance when you pass an AC current from the tip of the penis to the, um, to the base. And this, of course, is measured again on a recording device. Good correlation with Rigiscan, but again, we're not really entirely sure how to diagnose a venous leak, in, even with electrobioimpedance. So where might the leak sites be? And clearly, everywhere on this picture. Where you, where you see something blue, it could leak, and probably more beyond. So I'm going to talk a bit about treatment, look at the ablation and embolization, and then focus towards the end on uh, surgical treatments, ligation and resection, which are essentially combined into one. Various things have been used for ablation. Success rates, this is really for 24 months here, up to 78%. But what you do see with these is that the success rate, in common with virtually every intervention, declines with time, particularly from 3 to 12 and from 12 to 24 months. The best of these really was ethanol, and this is primarily because there was uh, ongoing cavernosography at the same time with repeated injections of ethanol until the leaks had disappeared. Embolization, again, um, used quite extensively in, in studies, never really repeated, and again, success rates are hugely variable and again disappearing down with time. Various other surgical techniques before we get to um, before we get to resection, and as you can see, it probably, it probably took me longer to figure out a title for this slide than the actual response to the surgery. And we're talking incredibly low numbers. For the femoral artery, N equals four. Hardly something that any of us would base our practice on. So ligation, again, where would we ligate? Well, everything has been tried. This first um, study uh, for deep dorsal vein, this was uh, Justin Vale and Roger Kirby's uh, look at deep dorsal vein ligation. Uh, numbers just less than 30, and again, what they found really was that their, with time, their success uh, dwindled a little bit. But again, no real data past two years. And one can easily see that if you just ligate the deep dorsal vein, then the whole of the infrapubic part of the venous drainage of the penis really is left. And so you can easily see why this wouldn't be an effective, long-lasting therapy. They have tried the penile vein ligation. But of course, if you ligate the penile vein, you're missing out the deep dorsal vein. So again, it's really just half of the picture. And once again, the success is not uh, huge when you look at long-term data, which again is up to two years at the most. They've tried to double ligate the veins. Well, what if we do the superficial on the deep dorsal? I'm, I'm not entirely convinced that the superficial dorsal vein of the penis will be a huge uh, contributor. But nevertheless, they've tried that, and you can see the success rate's very low. That's predominantly because this is the, probably the longest follow-up period of any of the studies. It's five years. So you can, if you'd extrapolate that back to the previous slide, you can see that there's a dwindling of time, even from 24 up to 60 months. The deep dorsal and the cavernous veins, that makes a bit more sense to me, but still the crural veins are being missed out. The bulbourethral vein is being missed out. And so, again, the success rates are not um, long-lived. Mass ligation, well, this has uh, been popularized by Lou, having been previously introduced a few years earlier. Success rates, again, up to perhaps 70% at two years. Why does that fail? Well, that's, I think that's slightly harder to figure out. Is it the superficial dorsal vein? I don't think any of us would think that. So there must be another reason. This is the technique that Lou popularized with his penis scrotal incision going, um, to uh, access the penis um, and dividing the suspensory ligament. And you can just see on this one, again, I've plagiarized this from um, Paddy O'Reilly's book, if he's in here, thank you. 
Uh, and you can see that he, they've, we've, a tie here is just proximal to the entry of the cavernosal artery. Now, if you summarize all of the surgical uh, interventions all in one, which probably isn't great science, but probably is up to all of the venous leak science that is out there, you can quite clearly see that the outcome is poor. Excellent outcome in a third of patients, well, again, not something that any of us would uh, love to see, and a significant decline in response rate after 12 months. There are complications, and these have been reported in the literature, penile shortening, hyposthesia, there's been an incidence of priapism, degree of penile um, deviation, and then, of course, no complication in this would be uh, complete without the wound infection, which is actually just in one of Hoang and Yang's 35 patients. How do you select the patients? Again, I, I'm not sure that that's really very clear. The books would have you believe that this should be short-duration tumescence. So I would say it should be incomplete tumescence and early detumescence that would probably lead you into thinking about a venous leak. It, it, I think lifelong ED, of course. Nobody would suggest with the absence of trauma that you'd get a venous leak any, any other way. These patients usually fail to respond to pharmacotherapy. Ideally, you would insist on, you'd think that they should have a normal arterial inflow. And I think, again, if you think about the literature, a, a significant number of patients included in all of these studies were all, older than 50. And I think logic would dictate to all of us that those patients with venous leak, if we were thinking about it a bit more frequently, they would be diagnosed at a much younger age and therefore much more likely to have an intact arterial inflow. The books also suggest that we should look for an isolated leak, but I think actually the evidence would point against that. Most of these are not isolated leaks. There may be some, but in particular if you look at the ethanol studies, these are, there are multiple leaks involved. And so I think the, the, the thought of an isolated leak, probably, in my view, is probably incorrect. The literature is awash with inadequacies. Uh, the selection criteria varies. The diagnosis varies. They don't all use the same technique. The outcomes vary. Some people are using penetrative intercourse with, some without the aid of PD-5 inhibitors. Some are just purely looking on uh, parameters of an end diastolic volume. The follow-up is poor, 12 months, some, some as low as three months, but no real long-term solutions into, or long-term follow-up other than this, that single study with 60 to 70 months. The age of the studies is difficult. Most of these studies are over 20 years old. And they, they suffer from a complete lack of duplication. It's almost as if we publish on one thing and then we move to the next. So there is a huge um, area that we need to focus on in order to really get to the crux of the venous leak, both diagnosis and therapy. Another note of caution here is that a certain number of men, a certain percentage of men with a normal erectile function will demonstrate a venous leak on cavernosography. There must therefore be other factors. What would cause a venous leak to be symptomatic in some, but not in others? So, despite the fact that this was debatable, this subject, I think it unfortunately throws up a few more answers, a few more questions rather, than we have answers to. What is the cause of venous leak? Are there multiple sites? Are there multiple causes? If we correct those, those leaks that we can see, are there occult leaks? What, what do we do with arterial insufficiency if that is coexistent? Do people form collaterals? Where do we do the colored Doppler ultrasound? And, and in fact, probably the last one here is the one we do have the answer to. Do we underdiagnose? Well, probably we do. It's like all those things, a bit like, it's like urethra's articular. Unless we think of those things, we don't make the diagnosis. Where do we start? Well, this is the uh, Austrian economist uh, who was very fond of saying that if you can't measure something, you can't improve it. The, truth, the same is true for venous leak. If we can't diagnose and figure out a way of uh, measuring how bad it is, how can we possibly improve it? So we probably need to go back to the way we diagnose and have something effective. So the, the final uh, thought really is, uh, is venous leak a disorder spectrum? Does it have multifaceted influencing factors, each of which playing a role? And are we then coming back to this issue that is so often quoted in patient safety factors? And that is, is it the Swiss cheese model? Is this the anthropological Swiss cheese? Do we need arterial insufficiency? Does that play a role? Probably does. What about the tunica? The inadequacy of the tunical uh, mechanism? The emissary vein dysfunction? All of these are probably existent. Do we need all of these to pass a critical level at which point we end up with symptomatic presentation? I don't know the answer to that. The answer probably is yes, but how do we unravel all of, the, uh, all of this to block up the holes in the cheese? So uh, just before I go then, I, I think it is debatable. There's a very poor evidence base. 
There has been an attempt at guideline, particularly for diagnosis, but actually this, is, this clearly is lacking, as subsequent literature has shown us. And uh, even patient selection is probably up for debate. I think we should aim to have a national, uh, nationwide consensus and even a collection of pooling of data. Uh, standardized data collection, I think, would be something that would uh, hugely improve the situation for us because I think most of us probably see a few of these every year. None of us, I'd, I suspect, outside or perhaps of London and, and other big cities have a great experience of this. So I'll just leave you with the, um, a few words of wisdom from the 45th President of the United States in the victory speech to the, to the loser. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for thank you very much for that um, very comprehensive talk on venous leakage. Um, shall we move on to the next? Okay, our next speaker is Sox Minas, who needs no introduction. However, in the interest of protocol, I will say that he's been a leading light in andrology since he was appointed 13 years ago at the Institute of Urology. He's published widely, particularly in uh, penile cancer. And he's actually the past chairman of this section back in 2010. I give you Mr. Sox Minas. <laughs> Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, it's the kindest word you've ever said about me, actually. Uh, thank you very much. So I've got a very short period of time to talk to you about living with sickle cell disease, um, impact on sexual health and fertility. So this is, remember, a young group of patients who have quite severe um, effects in terms of the pathophysiological effects of their disease on both their sexual function and their fertility. So I'm going to try and highlight the areas that we're going to cover. So there's a few areas that we're going to cover. One is stuttering priapism. These patients are at increased risk of developing this priapism itself. Many of you at some stage would have seen a patient with um, priapism who suffers from sickle cell disease, hypogonadism, erectile dysfunction, and subfertility. Again, the literature is scant in the last three areas. So just in terms of diagnosis, just remember that sickle cell actually is a spectrum of hematological disorders. And as you can see, many of these disorders, in fact, will result in priapism, but to less severity and also less commonly as well. So sickle hemoglobin is an abnormal hemoglobin. And what this is due to is um, there is, a, there is basically replacement or substitution of glutamic acid by valine uh, at the position of 6 on the beta globulin chain. So what happens? So if you look normally in, in oxygenated tissue or in normal um, cells, what you see is the normal disc-shaped cells are deformable and their lifespan is usually about 120 days. In contrast, in terms of sickle cell disease, what you see is sickle cell-shaped cells. They're more rigid and they live for less longer as well. And this is an important fact um, which we're going to show you in a second. What about the prevalence of incidence of sickle cell disease? Well, it's high. And if you look in African Americans, the incidence is about one in 375. Um, and in fact, one in 12 African Americans are carriers for the disorder as well. And these are interesting in various other subgroups and populations, as you can see, that also have sickle cell um, disease. And you'd be surprised, actually, that um, one in 58,000 Caucasians um, have sickle cell. This is the age, sorry, the distribution geographically, and not surprisingly, as you can see, parts of America, South America, Africa, uh, the Middle East, Turkey, and also areas of Europe where it does appear to be endemic, particularly also in South, Southern India as well. So it is very common. So what is the pathophysiology? Why do these patients, why are these patients ill? Because many of these patients spend a long time in hospital um, and coming backwards and forwards. And you'll see a lot of these patients, particularly if they have priapism or stuttering priapism. Well, the answer is, is that in deoxygenated blood, we already talked about the HBS, um, which is sickle hemoglobin, um, polymerizes um, and the fibers basically polymerize. What happens here is that you essentially get dehydrated and adherent sickle cells. What does that do? Well, you get um, dysregulation of the vasomotor activity of blood vessels, which I'm going to talk about in a second in the context of priapism. And furthermore, what also happens is you, get, you tend to get um, distal ischemia. Again, this is depicted pictorially here. As you can see, the sickle cells here, ischemia, you get tissue infarction as well, tissue inflammation. This manifests in various organs, including priapism, pulmonary hypertension as well. But what's quite interesting is that you also get hemolysis as well, and hemolysis within blood vessels. And you can imagine that in the penis, and you imagine in a second we're going to talk about nitric oxide. And 
heme itself acts actually as an um, oxidant. So oxidation results in nitric oxide um, being mopped up by free radicals. So therefore there's a reduction in terms of nitric oxide chronically in these patients and as we'll see may have a pathophysiological role in stuttering priapism and its treatment. So you get red cell injury, which we've already talked about, hemolysis, and adhesion of the red cells to the endothelium. That in itself results in ischemia, infarction, as you get aggregates of cells, vasoocclusion, local hypoxia. And interestingly, you get propagation of this process, as clearly you get more and more deoxygenated blood within these systems or within the system itself. And as I said, dysregulation of the vas vasomotor tone, in other words, nitric oxide. And these are some of the manifestations. I won't go through all of them. Many of you will be aware of them, um, including this aplastic crisis as well. But again, priapism as well. And these are the chronic manifestations of this ischemia and vasomotor dysregulation that you get. And again, these are the various organs. So you often see those patients, don't you, who are jaundiced. Um, they are anemic as well. And often you do see patients with erectile dysfunction. And this is all part of this pathophysiological process or cyclin um, that you get. It's interesting, isn't it, as well, that many of these patients don't live very long either. And this is a study, the only study, in fact, I could find in terms of mortality. And as you can see here, um, in certainly in the male patients who are HBSS, the median survival was 42, which is young, okay, which is younger than me. So I wouldn't want to die at 42. Again, if you look in terms of hospital admissions and you look at the data in terms of patients being admitted for various problems, you can see, in fact, that although if we take away the chest problems and the anemia here, you can actually see that priapism accounts for about 50% of hospital admissions, so a significant burden. So many of you um, will see these patients, particularly in built-up areas and inner cities. This highlights the risk of priapism. Um, one such study, about 20%. Um, in this series, but again, it varies from about 20 to 50 percent. So priapism is an area, of course, that we want to try and avoid in these patients. We can avoid, and what we want to try and do is avoid this patient here who is about to have a penile implant. You can see here that he's a bruised and swollen penis. So the facts are these, in fact, if you look at priapism and the risk factors for priapism, um, ischemic priapism is uncommon with sickle cell trait, but still does occur. But prevalence rates in men um, with disease are high, and about 42%. So it, it's a significant burden in this group of patients. And certainly about 35% of patients have a history of prolonged ischemic priapism as well. In children, actually, the figures are much higher, and 75% um, or 72% of children have a history of stuttering priapism as well. And in fact, the rates of erectile dysfunction, which we assume are resulting as a chronic hypoxia, results in um, cavernosal fibrosis in this group of patients, um, is secondary to the duration of ischemic um, priapic episodes and also is related to a number of ischemic priapic, priapic episodes. Not surprising, you may think. So again, you can say that over 89% of patients with sickle cell disease will have a priapic episode or priapism by the age of 20. So pretty significant figures. And what we're trying to avoid is obviously these type of patients who we see the following day uh, on the ward rounds. What happens as you get older? Well, historically, I have to say from a personal observation, I often think that it gets better. But if you look at studies that have been conducted, often patients will still have priapic episodes up to the age of 43. But more severe uh, priapic episodes seem to decrease in frequency. So in other words, it seems to be the severity as they get older decreases, which we're, not unsure, we're, we're unsure slightly of why that should happen. So again, remember the priapism, we're not here to teach you to suck eggs, but prolonged penile erection in the absence of sexual stimulation persists. The only reason why I would put this slide up is say we would normally rely on the four-hour rule, but in this group of patients, should we be relying on a two-hour rule? In other words, because often these patients don't respond to conventional treatments, which I'll highlight in one second. Just to remind you of the anatomy or the physiology of penile erection, remember the corpora cavernosa, the sinusoids, lined by an endothelium, both enos, which is endothelial nitric oxide synthesis, producing nitric oxide and non-adrenergic, non-cholinergic nerves. Remember, nitric oxide is basically combined with guanylate cyclase. Um, GTP is converted into cyclic GMP, which is clearly the intercellular second messenger, as you all know, which causes corporal smooth muscle relaxation. And this is then broken down by PD5 into 5 GMP, or it's in inactive form as well. Again, just to highlight more generally, why do you give alpha-1 agonists? It's like, for example, phenylephrine in this group of patients. Well, the answer is, is that you stimulate smooth muscle contraction in that group. And I'm going to highlight something called adenine, or, um, which also increases cyclic AMP, which is relevance in a second.
So there's also rho kinase pathway. And the reason why I'm mentioning this in this group of patients is dysregulation of this pathway. And normally, rho kinase itself causes smooth muscle contraction. So you can use rho kinase, which is called ROC1 and 2, and the isoform 2 is the most common one. But essentially, people have used rho kinase inhibitors in animal models to induce penile erection. Rho kinase itself um, causes smooth muscle contraction um, in this group of patients. Remember, in that hypoxic environment you have with low flow priapism, you can see that there is hypoxia within the smooth muscle or corporal cells. And the argument here is that decreased oxygen causes obstruction of the vessels by the pathophysiological mechanisms we've already talked about in terms of the vasomotor dysregulation. This creates venous stasis, and ultimately you get ischemia, penile fibrosis, and erectile dysfunction, which accounts for why they have erectile dysfunction in this group of patients. Now, there's an interesting alternative theory, which is why I've put up all those slides. And the answer is, is this, that we already talked about the normal physiological mechanism of nitric oxide. But in priapism, remember, we talked about in the sickle cell patient, they have, in fact, hemolysis, and therefore they have more heme swimming around. Remember, I talked about heme taking up nitric oxide. So, in fact, what you tend to get in patients with in this group of patients with, for example, stuttering priapism, is you get chronic depletion of nitric oxide. Chronic depletion of nitric oxide in itself results in a decreased expression of PD-5 enzymes. So remember, PD-5 is that enzyme that breaks down um, the cyclic GMP. So what that means is that although the cyclic GMP levels initially are chronically depleted, if a patient, for example, in an anoxic or hypoxic state, in fact, gets stimulated by non-adrenergic, non-cholinergic nerves and releases is nitric oxide, then this has an augmentative effect in terms of this physiology. In other words, you get a much in higher increase in cyclic GMP. So the pathway is particularly interesting because it's changed now the concept of treatment of this drug. Now, if I said a few years ago, 10 years ago, if we sort of suddenly said that actually we'll be giving these patients sildenafil, and I'm going to show you why in a second, then you would probably have laughed. So what we see in, in these patients is, in fact, and, and this is, in fact, in studies that we've seen, is in sickle cell patients, you actually see a decrease in PD-5 expression. And also, you also see um, in the sickle cell patients here um, a decrease in rho kinase expression. Remember, this is the contractile pathway. So in these patients with stuttering priapism and sickle cell disease, you do see a state of change in terms of vasomotor state. And again, one of the areas which we're going to come back to is in terms of ischemia. So not only is there dysregulation, of course, you get chronic hypoxia resulting in ischemia, which is shown here. But the evidence base in terms of ischemia and how we treat these patients, of course, is very limited. And this is one such paper, and in fact, one of very few only papers that describe the effects of terms of ischemia hypoxia. Again, this rule here in terms of 24 hours is a very controversial area as well. In terms of management, of course, the priapic patient in, in terms of management, those with sickle cell disease should be no different from those with non-sickle cell disease. And interestingly, you still have to go through the stepwise process into aspiration, irrigation, corporal injection, and distal shunting, and possibly insertion of penile implant. And remember, time is of the essence. The key area, of course, is what happens at 72 hours. Some people argue less. Even in the priapic patient, due to sickle cell disease, should you be putting in a penile implant into that patient? Should you be doing certain types of shunt, which have been described, which again are controversial? But what we do know is that in many ways, some of these treatments now almost have become obsolete. Um, adrenergic agonists, of course, is a primary treatment. So it's interesting, exchange transfusions in this group of patients as well. Do we normally use them? Often we use these types of treatments in terms of reducing the priapic um, severity. The answer is that there's very little or very no, in fact, very little evidence within the literature um, reporting on the use of exchange transfusion in this cohort of patients. So therefore, what we need to consider is can start considering these different types of pathophysiological mechanisms that I've already outlined um, in terms of the vasomotor dysregulation that you commonly get. And in fact, this is a hematologist's perspective in terms of what they feel. And it's quite interesting in this that um, serious questions have arisen regarding the efficacy and mainstays of um, treatment of severe priapism, and particularly in terms of intravenous fluids, alkalization, and exchange transfusion, um, which they would now question. Interestingly, Looking over time, the hematologist's argument would be in this group of patients, in fact, very little has changed over 25 years. So just to go back to that treatment of stuttering priapism, that group of patients that you see, 
There are various other mechanisms. So we've already talked about this chronic reduction in nitric oxide and the possibility of using PD-5 inhibitors, which increases the expression of the enzyme PD-5, so therefore um, breaking down cyclic GMP in this altered microenvironment. You often also get adenosine, which is produced, which is, which is a smooth muscle relaxant as well. And there are people who are using adenosine deaminases, which are enzymes that break down um, adenosine, therefore um, reducing smooth muscle relaxation, which is what you want in this private episode. And also we talked about the ROC pathway as well. So if you look at things in terms of administration of PD-5 inhibitors, this is perhaps a novel concept in term, which has been introduced over the last two to three years, particularly from the Americans, and therefore the use of this in terms of restoring PD-5 levels back to normal, and therefore restoring normal vascularity in the penis where nitric oxide is chronically depleted. This is a study, just to show you, this is one of um, studies, caution again, small numbers of patients. There are more studies in literature, but very small numbers of patients within these. But what these show is the use of sildenafil in this group of patients, interestingly, reduced the number of priapic episodes um, considerably by 50% of reduction in um, frequency, um, interestingly. And overall, fourfold fewer priapic related hospital admissions as well by the use of PD-5 inhibitors. And there were certainly no significant differences in outcomes. In those patients who have priapic episodes or stuttering priapism, in other words, recurrent bouts of priapic episodes, what can you do? Well, these are various medications you can use. Many of them are antiandrogens, CPA, stilbestrol, spironolactone. But, of course, the effects of these drugs, particularly in children or young men, of course, are largely unknown in terms of long-term effects on their fertility. Ketoconazole as well, we've already talked about sildenafil, but perhaps one in the prior prison patients that are commonly used with sickle cell disease is etilephrine, uh, which is an oral alpha-1 agonist, in other words, causes smooth muscle contraction. And certainly some studies have reported good efficacy in this group of patients as well. And there are various other drugs as well. Um, pseudoephedrine, again, in my experience, doesn't work particularly well in this group of patients. And certainly etilephrine can be a first-line treatment in terms of preventative measure in that group of patients. So what about erectile dysfunction? We've already seen why you get erectile dysfunction. What's quite interesting, if you compare sickle cell patients with non-sickle cell patients, the degree of erectile dysfunction you get, certainly in terms of mild erectile dysfunction, is considerably higher in that group of patients, presumably because they get more hypoxic-related episodes and more corporal fibrosis in that group. And certainly if you look at recurrent episodes, 40% of patients will have erectile dysfunction in that group. It does appear to be related to the frequency of these and the duration of these episodes as well. So it's important to try and prevent those stuttering priapic episodes as the resultant effects might well be erectile dysfunction. In fact, if you look at patients with RIP in terms of sickle cell patients, they're nearly five times more likely to develop erectile dysfunction, which clearly in a young group of patients is quite significant. What about new emergent therapies in this group? Well, people have talked about nitric oxide don donating compounds because of that chronic reduction in terms of the microenvironment of nitric oxide. Pentoxifiline, which of course is an antioxidant as well, but also has co um, collagen properties as well. And remember I mentioned adenosine as well, and these have all been suggested within animal models as well. Well, what about testosterone? I'm going to move now to hypogonadism quickly. And in terms of hypogonadism, it's interesting that although patients, is testosterone deficiency a possible risk factor in these patients? Well, the answer is no, and this is a study which has shown this. But interestingly, if you look at this study, many of these patients are hypogonadal, but that doesn't seem to relate to the degree or frequency of priapic episodes. Why are they hypogonadal? Well, it's interesting. There are two schools, there are two arguments about this. One is whether LH and FSH levels are low. Therefore, do these patients have hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism as opposed to hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism? In other words, due to um, a, low, a high FSH and LH. If you look at endocrine factors within this cohort of patients, um, you again, this study, and there's very few studies in the literature have shown that patients who have um, sickle cell disease have lower testosterone, and furthermore, in this group of patients, they have low F FSH and LH in this particular study. And this is just documented here, where the LH and FSH level and testosterone levels differ, as you can see in the two in the control arm versus the sickle cell patients here.
This study, in contrast, actually um, shows that it may be hypergonadotrophic, hypogonadism, in this group of patients based upon stimulation tests. So I think the jury's out, but what we do know is these patients do suffer from hypergonadism. More interestingly as well, that puberty seems to be delayed, um, certainly delayed by one to two years, and that's highlighted again in this study. So not only do they have developmental problems as well, they also have hypergonadism. And again, if you look in terms of growth, skeletal age, and height as well, these all seem to positively correlate with sickle cell disease and its effects. So this has a significant and profound effect on development in this group of patients. What about testosterone placement? Because the next logical step would be, well, if these guys are hypergonadal, could we give them testosterone? But we're a little bit worried because, of course, testosterone itself might induce a prior pick episode. The answer to the question is no, it doesn't. And from this small series of patients, um, testosterone replacement therapy in these patients is safe and doesn't seem to induce a prior pick episode. And this just shows you in patients with sickle cell disease, IAF increased, and the ADAMS score, which is a measure of hypogonadism, decreased in terms of severity of symptoms due to hypogonadism. What about fertility, finally? I could just come to the last few slides here. Well, why should they have fertility problems? We already mentioned about erectile dysfunction. Of course, that could be a factor. We've already mentioned about hypogonadism as well, and we've talked about low testosterone in this group of patients as well, and also talked about sexual maturation as well. But there are sperm abnormalities as well in this group of patients, which is significant. Hydroxyurea is an interesting compound or, or drug which is often used in these patients and actually inhibits DNA synthesis. Why, does, why is that important? Well, actually, in terms of hemoglobin F, or normal hemoglobin, um, there seems to be more conversion from HBS to F in, when hydroxyurea is given. And there's a reduction in complications in this group of patients in terms of sickle cell patients receiving hydroxyurea. So hydroxyurea is a positive thing. In, and certainly there are a few case reports reporting its use in patients with um, stuttering priapism. The important aspect to this is this, is that if you look at patients, and there's very few studies again, and look at semen analysis in patients with priapism, you can see here that the, um, the, in terms of the presence of abnormalities, almost 40% in some series have abnormalities in sperm count, um, motility as well, even up to 80%. And if you compare that with patients on hydroxyurea, which is often used prophylactically in this group of patients, Hydroxyurea, interestingly, actually impairs semen parameters even more. So therefore, this clearly raises a dilemma in that group of patients. So this paper is quite an important one. It highlights the deficiencies in terms of um, semen parameters in this group of patients. And furthermore, the drug hydroxyurea and its long-term effects in lowering semen parameters in that group of patients. And when patients stop the drug, you can see that things improve. Seam analysis, well, if you look at small studies, and I look back in the literature here, and it's from the 80s and 70s as well, very few studies have been performed, and you can see here that overall about 20% of patients have a reduction in their semen parameters, which clearly has major importance in this group of patients who want to father children, especially in this younger age group. And then finally, in terms of other treatments, and this is about stem cells and hemopoietic stem cells and the use of this now in terms of treatment of patients with priapism. And this, in fact, is a case report describing um, the use of this and stimulation with FSH and LH analogues um, and imp improving pregnancy rates naturally in a patient who is azospermic. The literature, again, is very deficient. So I can summarize it overall and say to you that 89% of sickle cell patients approximately experience a prior pick episode by the age of 20, significant, and particularly in urological practice, and you will see these patients. The erectile dysfunction is associated with recurrent stuttering priapism, and the association is about 40%, which clearly is significant in this young cohort of patients. The clinical and laboratory findings suggest that there is a high risk or prevalence of hypogonadism in this patient group as well, and certainly there is a delay in sexual maturation. And most importantly as well, there are sperm abnormalities as well, which of course can lead to problems in terms of long-term fertility in this difficult group of patients. I thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sucks. Um, that was an excellent talk. Um, I'm sure we'll have questions. We are running a bit short of time, so we probably have time for a couple quick questions. Um, Sucks, I'd like to ask you a question. Excellent talk, particularly the information about using Viagra and testosterone, which is something we try and avoid. What is your preferred current uh, drug regime for the sort of nocturnal recurrent ischemic priapism? What are you prescribing for these patients? Now? In sickle cell patients? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Etilephrine. And in non-sickle cell? 
I would still try and want etilephrine, but the problem is, is that for non-sickle cell, it doesn't seem to work particularly well. So in that group of patients, you often will go on to drugs like um, antiandrogens, which of course is worrisome because you get these patients then who of clearly want to have children who have more important issues such as erectile function. So it's difficult, but etilephrine you can try, which is now for one agonist. I just have one quick question for Ian. Um, the cases of patients with venous leaks, obviously quite rare cases, very difficult and challenging to accept. I think the way the climate is changing, especially in andrology, what are your thoughts on discussing these complex rare patients within the forum of an andrology MDT? Thank you. Um, Yes, I think we should be setting up at least regional, depending on the figures, may even have to go to national, but I think regional would be a workable solution, really, because I don't think anybody, as say, outside of London, probably has a huge practice of these, of these patients. Yeah. Okay, in order to, uh, to, you know, to keep the time, I just want to thank all the speakers for excellent talks, and we'll move on.